but you know, I mean, if one person's doing it all, well, if you if you mess it up, well, then that's kind of your baby. But uh, like you know, we'll have we'll have a row here, and then she'll have some little containers like this, and she'll put them out in front of it, and then I'll move it out to the greenhouse, or move it back from the greenhouse, uh, because our greenhouse is unheated, and you know, some things can survive a greenhouse that's unheated, and some things really have a really have a hard time. So, uh, like I said. Uh, yes, we now have three or four little containers of cabbage, kale, or broccoli. <laughs> we're not really sure what they are. And until we put them in the ground, we're not going to know. What it's kind of a surprise guard sometimes with us. <laughs> but that that happens, you know. But a lot of things happen, that happens. Hey, Jack. Yes, sir. You mentioned pre soaking some seeds. There's a trick I learned years ago when I was messing around with planting irises from seed. And it's basically just wrap that bundle of seeds up in cheesecloth so that they're not going to come out and just hang it. As long as you're not using one of those little floaty ducky things in the back of your toilet bowl tank, <laughs> just hang it back in there because then every time you're flushing several times a day, you know, you're draining oh and redoing it. <laughs> and it actually speeds up the pre-soak process significantly. It basically stimulates, you know, what to happen if they're laying on the ground outside all through the winter, rain, snow. Yeah, yeah. And what? flush, flush, flush. Huh? <laughs> what class? <laughs> hey, we could do that up here and commercialize that whole process. You You're flushing <laughs> seeds, man. <laughs> uh, Robert, you want to bet those with us before you say any more stuff? Yes. <laughs> this won't be on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've done several gardening forums. You know, for Iris, because it takes you pre soaking for months. It means that the process is no, in the dark, so it helps. Iris seeds. Seeds. We do have some Irish seeds. We do have some. We have got them in the ground. I know, but we have flushed them. No, no, we don't. Pick up whatever, 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 all else. What's that odor? Uh, I don't know if y'all ever have started stuff in, in containers like this or in, in the little plastic bills or cottage cheese. Uh, but have you ever noticed, once you get them in there, and you plant them, and then you come back for your water. Oh, by the way, I think this is a godsend. Best thing that ever happened to seed start. Because whenever you, you can get your water and get fairly warm, and you can dock for each one and things without bringing in the water hose. Mm -hmm. That way, if you, you, can, you can pinpoint where you want the water. But before you do that, the spray. If you'll get that, uh, your soil mix out and you get your, your seeds in the ground or in the starter and you moist them, spray them down with a uh, spray bottle, it breaks the surface tension and keeps the seeds from floating out so badly when you do put the water to it. That's something to think about because I'm sure it well, it, or it might be just me, but if you get your get that starting mix in there and you start watering it, everything floats up and you see. Well, I had the seeds on the left side. Who knows where they are now? <laughs> I don't know if y'all have ever run across that. That might be just unique in my situation. But if you use a sprinkler, a sprayer, it seems to help quite a bit. Good idea. And whenever you, well, I, I mentioned a while ago, you don't want to. You're not growing aquatics, you're not growing lily pads. Well, you may be, I mean, it could be. But uh, you just don't, you don't want to flood them. You want to keep them moist and, and slightly damp, but you don't want to flood them. You don't want to drown them. Because you can drown them, they'll turn yellow and they'll, they'll, you'll go in there, check them one morning, and they'll all be laying over there saying, I'm dead. I don't know if y'all have ever had that problem. I killed a lot of plants over the years. Uh, <coughs> Once the plants get up, they need a little light. Uh, I use a shop light. I use a four-foot shop light with regular fluorescent bulbs. Uh, we had a fellow say, well, I've done it, but I've used the grow light bulbs. Those are pretty expensive. You can buy a shop light, well, last time I checked, from Walmart for about eight bucks, eight to twelve bucks. They're four foot, they've got the bulbs, they've got the chains, they've got everything they need except being plugged into the wall and the light switch turned on. 
And if you're using a, a fluorescent tube, uh, put it right down on top of your plants. They, the, the plants will grow to the light. And if you have the, the light source down on top of them, they don't have, they don't have very, many very many choices for the growth. And like you said this morning, in your little program, once they get up, brush them. That stimulates the root, the stems, seems to help quite a bit. It keeps them getting long and leggy, and, and keeps them light real down, real close to them, really healthy. It makes the stem stronger. Yes, it does. It really does. It, it, it stimulates the strength of the It mimics them getting yes, the natural breeze. Uh, is there any particular bulbs to use? For the, for the shop lights, there's like cool light and light. I think it's like a daylight. But the cool lights are cheap. You know, yeah, whatever whatever comes in the cheap kit works real well. Can I comment on that? Yes, ma'am. We're messing around with that at the school because we basically are trying to do everything we can without spending much money. Yes. And um, everything that I found, like if you, you've got to be careful with the warm light because your plants do need to be closed, but the warm will immediate, <coughs> emit some heat and it's going to dry, it's going to dry your, your plants out quicker. And so of all the research I've done, and this is what we've decided to do is Usually your ballasts have either four lights or two. Mm -hmm. They say to put one cool and one warm, one cool and one warm. Because the warm and the cool will each put out a different spectrum yeah. of, of, of light. And I can't remember, I've got the article, the yellows and the reds and the blues. But they say if you will combine those, because they're both inexpensive. Yeah. If you have a two, ba if you have a two bulb, ballast do one warm and one cool and that will give you the more broader spectrum of light plus not emit as much heat as if you had two warms. Uh, the good thing about well uh, like you said the good thing well I, I'll back up the thing about a fluorescent tube is they don't put off a whole lot of heat. Not much. And that's good and bad because actually you need a little heat Preferably from underneath to keep the soil warm, but you don't want it so hot on the top that you burn your, your seedlings up. And uh, transplanting, we we use a number of things to transplant, especially if we're raising them in <coughs> something like this. Uh, uh, plastic fork works real well because what you want to do is you want to dig them, pick them out of the ground. And uh, we've, uh, you'll be surprised how little, uh, how, how little you kill by transplanting. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm being kind of vague with that, but we, uh, they, they look pretty rough. But they transplant fairly well and they'll, they'll survive a lot. I just transplanted a bunch of parsley. And it was the most pitiful looking little stuff, you know, but like this. And I transplanted them with, I just dug them out with a little plastic fork and transplanted them into something larger. And you think there is no way that poor baby will see. You'll even see little teardrops coming from your eyes. And almost teardrops from mine because I thought, well, I've got to transplant them or they're not going to make it anyway because they were real close together. And they have done one thing. They just, it's amazing how well they will survive and how strong they really are. How big were they when you, because we got oh, some, they're just they were, big. They, yeah. they did have leaves on them. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> they did have leaves. But did as in past? <laughs> but they're doing, they're doing. Great. Okay. Don't you said they survive. We've got to do it also. That's why I'm asking. I think that I have lost maybe two or three out of like 50. So, so that's not that's not bad odds at all. I think I did pretty good considering how pitiful <laughs> they look. <were. laughs> so anyway, when I first when I was first trying to do transplanting and didn't know really what I was doing, I would wait until they got bigger and bigger and bigger because I thought they had to be really big in order and look really healthy like they do in the Walmart six packs before. I, no, I mean it's amazing. You and so grow a hundred of them and see what you can do you know you don't have to transplant all of them and then and then you'll get more 
secure in doing it because you'll find out they really do survive. They really do survive some really sad situations. <laughs> um, we um, we want to encourage you to try to save seeds. Now, like I told you, when we're talking about seeds, you can't save heirlooms and do any good with them. Thank you. <laughs> there goes the business. <laughs> However, you can save hybrids if you say you went to um, Walmart and you bought a package of some kind of hybrid that you just love and you just have to have it, and you don't get it planted this year. You can take that package of seeds and you can put them in a plastic freezer bag or an ice cream bucket or something and put them in the freezer or in a dark, cool, dry place and they will probably still do fine for you next year. If you are saving a seed that you have opened, you can do the same thing. You say that you planted half of the tomatoes you bought but you have some left you can put them in a freezer bag or a container, make sure it's dry, cool, and dark, and label them what you've got and put them in the freezer. We do have, just like not knowing what plants, what cabbage, kale, or broccoli I have, we do have a whole bag in our freezer that says unknown tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, we do have that. <laughs> because we have saved seeds that we didn't mark 100 years ago, and we don't know for sure what they are. So if we ever want to have a surprise garden, we can do that. But that's not a good idea. You really need to know what you have, so be sure you label it and mark it. Now let's say that you have some seeds that somebody shared with you last year, and you and they told you that they got them from their grandmother's freezer or whatever. And they've been in the freezer. And they've been in there for a long time, and you don't know if they're any good, and do you want to waste your whole garden spot for them? Well, let's say that you have, I've got black bean seed here, and I don't know if it's any good or not. I can take this black bean seed and put it in paper towels, a few layers of paper towels or a coffee filter, close it up, spray it down with water, just mist it down, put it inside of a freezer bag, label it so I know what it is and when I did this, and put it in a warm spot, like maybe on top of the refrigerator, and then in within a week or so, if these seeds are good, they will have sprouted for me. And if I want to know if some seed that I've had in the freezer for a long time is good, I can do that. Rather than going out there and putting it in the ground and waiting for three weeks for it to come up and it never does, and then I've wasted a bunch of planting time. So that's a good thing to do to find out if your seed is so good. We constantly use tomato <laughs> seeds in our for our own personal use that are five to seven or eight years old. Uh, tomato seeds in the freezer will last an indefinite period of time. Our grandparents, our great grandparents, didn't have the option for freezers. What they would do, they'd put them in a dark container. They would put them in the bottom shelf of the of the cabinet, way in the back, because the, the three worst enemies of any seed is moisture, light, and heat. If you can control that as much as possible, and I know that, that I use that disclaimer, as much as possible, that seed will last at least to next planting season. Uh, and, you know, you, I'm sure you've read about people that would open the tombs in Egypt and take wheat seed out of the tomb and plant it. That seed may be up to 2,000 years old. So that, that's also in the fix because we, we, we need to think outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed like your time to throw that in. Um, we recently came across some figures that just sort of blew our mind about seed diversity. In 1903, there were commercial seed houses in this country that offered hundreds of varieties of garden seed. And I'm just going to give you a little idea. If you wanted to buy cabbage in 1903, you could look it up in a catalog, and there were 544 varieties of cabbage alone. 
There were 497 varieties of lettuce, 463 varieties of radish, 408 tomatoes. Now that's in, in 1903. In 1983, there was a study done to see how much of that seed that was listed in 1903 for sale was still available to the public to buy. 544 varieties of cabbage in 1903. In 1983, there were only 28 of those left to be purchased. Lettuce, 497, and in 1983, only 36 remained. Radish, 463 to 27. Seed diversity is going away. Now you see, we still have lots of things we can buy as hybrids, but where do you think they make the hybrids from? The heirlooms have to be crossed in order to get them. And we just learned this last week that 75% of the seed diversity that we had in 1900 has been lost now. And we're losing 2% per year. Now, that gives us every reason in the world to want to save our own seed. We must not let all of our seed diversity be lost. We are not going to today go into all of the uh, ways that you need to save seed. Saving seed is a science in itself, but I will recommend to you a book called Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. This book will tell you everything that you need to know about saving seed. There are certain things that are very easy to save, like beans and no, well, uh, beans, uh, peppers, and tomatoes are the easiest. And then um, you go to some that are a little harder, like lettuce and radish and kale. And then you go to some that are really hard, like squash, watermelon, and cucumbers. Now those sound like they would be easy because they're easy to get hold of. Seed, yeah. However, you have to isolate a lot of things so that they will not cross. We were doing a seminar the other day, and there was a gentleman sitting in the back of the room, and he said, well, I save all my seed, and I save my, the best watermelon the world has ever seen. And we both just sort of cringed a little bit, didn't say anything, until we got to this part of our little talk, and we said, you know, watermelons, all other melons, cantaloupes and musk melons and those sorts of things, cucumbers, squashes, and pumpkins all cross with each other. And so, if you grow any of those other things with your watermelon, you are likely to have something cross. And then he put up his hand and he said, is that why my watermelon tasted like cucumber last year? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's probably what That's <laughs> probably it. And then he blamed it on his wife because she planted cucumbers in the garden. But, but there is a lot to know about seed saving. And someday we will do a seminar somewhere to, to explain to people all of the, the, the uh, ins, and outs. ins and outs of seed saving. But we encourage you to try to pick out something easy. Pick out beans or tomatoes or peppers and try to save those. And when you find out you can be successful with that, you know, when I taught school, I learned right off that if you want kids to really enjoy something, you better make them successful at it. And if you're a failure at something, then you don't want to do it anymore. So you want to be really successful. So pick something you can be successful at. And Jack is going to show you how to be Remember, successful. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> tomatoes are the gateway drug to gardening. <laughs> <laughs> and he is going to show you how to save your own tomato seed right now. But keep in mind, it has to be an heirloom. 